Strictly speaking, with me, Tarun Nangya. Today, we're going to discuss a topic that is at the heart of corporate India, that is the Godrej family settlement and succession planning. How beautifully it was done while preserving the relations, preserving the family uh, warmth. And that is what is important. And that is why the Godrej family settlement is an inspiration to corporate India. And we have three people who are going to speak on the same. Uh, I want to welcome Mr. Behram Vakil, who has worked on this settlement. He is the founding partner of AZB in Partners. For people who wouldn't know, he is the B in AZB, which is Ajay, Zia, and Behram. Good to see you, Mr. Vakil, and uh, looking forward to some interesting insights from you. We have with us Mr. Ryan Karanjawala, managing partner of Karanjawala and Company, one of India's leading litigating law firms at the Supreme Court of India. You have seen many a battles and many a corporate battles and want your insight uh, into how this settlement happened so beautifully while preserving the relationships. I have with me senior advocate Percival Billy Moria. We all must know he qualified as a chartered accountant before turning to law and has seen both sides. He was heading Cyril Amarchand Mangal Das in Delhi in the law firm, but now practices as a senior advocate at the Delhi High Court and the Supreme Court, including other forums. Good to see you, Mr. Billy Moria. And looking to your, forward to your insights as well. So before we go to Mr. Behram Vakil, I would request Mr. Karanjawala to give an opening comment and then we go to the specifics. Over to you, Mr. Karanjawala. So Tarun, this is an interesting one. You've got three Parsi lawyers speaking on a Parsi partition. So Behram, of course, was in this whole uh, desettlement and uh, the taking a part of the Godrej group. I, as a litigator, see things from a distance because we don't really participate in such things. But my experience is, or my observation is, that all the heritage firms, all the legacy companies, do not, as far as possible, seek to go to court, and rightly so. And uh, there was a little bit of murmuring about how one family, the daughters, inherited the company, but that was smoothened over. And even today, they are a very cohesive family and on many different things. Another family, which was again a heritage family, was the Goenka family. Who would get to keep the crockery set that they had used when the king had come to their house? So that's how smooth that particular partition was. Another partition of Northern India, which went very smoothly, was the hero group. That was partly because Bridgemon Munjal as a patriot and the patriarch of that, uh, as the patriarch of that family was a person whose nature was that he first kept the interests of the other family members before his own. And therefore, they were able to partition in such a smooth manner that today, different branches of the family are the producers of probably the largest number of cycles in the world and perhaps also the largest number of motorcycles in the world. So these are three families which have partitioned very smoothly. On the other hand, families that have gone to war have lost out greatly. There's, I remember I was in the Supreme Court this is about 30 years ago, when the Kamanis went to war. And the Kamanis were, at that time, a very well-known family of India. But today, one hardly ever hears their name. They were broken into little groups. You know, we, we were for some Lamnis Bhai, there was a Rasik Bhai, there was something called the Nalla Bhai, means the small brothers and so on. They went to war, fought, fought, fought for 10, 15 years, and ultimately ruined all their businesses. So that has been the history of what happens when you often go to court to litigate. Even the Ambanis, when they fought, both of them lost out greatly in terms of time that they could have spent building businesses. So this is what everyone has to remember when he chooses to go to court instead of settling a matter. Point very well taken and thank you for that interesting anecdote. I'll go to Mr. Behram Vakil uh, for his opening comment and uh, how they went about uh, you know, doing this in an amicable way. Yeah, so thanks a lot, uh, Tarun. Uh, uh, it's wonderful to be here, especially with uh, two dear friends. So that's a special treat. Uh, I have to, you know, uh, say two things at the outset. First of all, I think uh, your lead-in was really perfect because it's a real model in how you can do something in a dignified and gracious way and uh, most importantly, keep the family together. Uh, 
The second thing, unfortunately, I have to tell you is uh, uh, they are very close friends. So uh, I did not work on this matter. AZB did, but certainly I personally did not. So I, I just want that to be very okay. clear. But your firm uh, did. Yeah, but the firm did, exactly. Uh, I got to say, you know, uh, to uh, put it in one line, uh, I think that as Ryan showed in his amicable way, uh, early is best and late is a mess. So the earlier you get into this, maybe we can discuss it a uh, little later in the episode, but succession planning, because it's such an emotive subject, and because we are, of course, all of us are very emotional people, uh, I think the earlier you get to this, the more structured it is, it helps a lot. And uh, again, to repeat what Ryan said, uh, maybe I should not say it as a lawyer, but basically litigation uh, ruins the business for sure because there's brain damage, attention uh, being lost on the core business and uh, set aside the money and time. Uh, but someone said, is, is you know, semi-frivolous, that all you're doing is transferring your wealth from yourself to the lawyers. So uh, it is really a lose-lose. And I would urge uh, all families and all warring factions that, uh, uh, you know, wherever you can uh, do this earlier and try and settle rather than litigate. Thanks. Thanks for that good message and also uh, sharing how relations were preserved in this settlement. I'll go to Senior Advocate Percival Billy Moria for his opening comment. Thank you, Tarun, and <clears throat> indeed a privilege to be here with uh, two doyens of our profession. Uh, Tarun, you forgot to mention that prior to Cyril Amarchand, I was <clears throat> an integral part of AZB as well. So uh, as far as this uh, transaction is concerned, uh, you know, just as Ryan mentioned, uh, family settlements in court uh, for the reasons uh, mentioned by Ryan, because I think the courts have now evolved jurisprudence on this, uh, which has been aptly summarized in the decision of Haripat Singhania. Uh, it, it summarized all the past uh, jurisprudence on, on family settlement agreements. And what it says is that the courts will not lightly interfere with a family settlement agreement, if honestly made, of course. But if honestly made, the courts will not... Uh, will implement it in toto, and they will not allow legal lacunae, for example, to be a showstopper. And uh, one very good example is, uh, you know, you can't say uh, that uh, limitation, family settlements are subject to limitation, so, uh, you know, we will not implement it. Uh, so legal lacunae like that cannot be the reason for uh, family settlements not to be carried on through to their logical outcome. And I think the rationale, obviously, is, uh, you know, once the parties have shaken hands, it's all in the best interest of the family. Uh, it talks about the uh, concept of special equity of the family, their own kind of special equity, because of which uh, this uh, jurisprudence has evolved. Point, point well taken. Uh, now we'll go into specific comments. I'll go to Mr. Ryan Karanjawala. In Delhi, we saw a prominent business family. Two brothers shot each other dead over a farmhouse. I mean, they had assets worth thousands of crores, but a farmhouse which was barely worth 100 crore resulted in both of them dying. We have seen many such instances in India. Uh, of course, lawyers have fought, legal, I mean, legal families have fought uh, uh, over, uh, you know, uh, the asset or law firm. That also has happened. So lawyers are known to be wise people, but even they can fight. It's not as if lawyers are alien to this concept of fighting over property and inheritance of the law firm. But in India, property has been from, from people with small inheritances to business groups. Property has been a subject which has led to a lot of crime also in India. Property, property is one of the most, uh, what you can say, common reasons for crime. And finally, in corporate India today, this discussion is taking place that uh, you know, you have to let go of a lot of things. 
and you also get to keep a lot of things, but relations have to be preserved first. Could you make us understand that India has such a rich tradition of business, but 75 years after independence, now we are starting that discussion and why Godrej family settlement is indeed showing most businessmen the way ahead on how to deal with a family settlement over there. So businesses usually get partitioned when a business which was being led by one person or a group of people suddenly finds that the leadership is no longer there. So the person you looked up to in the family is no longer available. And then what happens is you look at your piece of the pie or what part of the business you're controlling. And you feel that somebody has a larger part of the business, somebody has a smaller part of the business. And you therefore want to go to court in order to enrich your own piece of the pie. Usually, a family which has a patriarch or a group of brothers who are controlling the and keeping everybody else in check is able to see the times through. Because there is growth, there is progress, and people are able to achieve what they want. But unfortunately, it is in situations where the patriarch goes away that immediately then there comes a sense of unease. Because the one person who they all looked up to is no longer there. So that's one of the reasons why, you know, families partition. Another reason why families sometimes partition is you find that growth has stopped. For some reason or the other, you're in a part of a business which is no longer growing at the pace at which you want it. So a person who has a larger piece of the pie may feel, okay, let me take a partition here and just hang on to what I have rather than depend on growth in the years to come. These are factors which constantly play a role. Also property, other things like that. So these are all things. And also a lot of it is ego management. You know, that is why, as Behram pointed out, CII has now got a whole department or a whole, you know, a family business team, council. Yeah, team, a family business council, which, as, as Behram also rightly said, early is better than late. So, before problems start, you nip them in the bud. Before a friction begins, you calm it down. And then businesses continue. You also, I'm sure the Family Business Council will also be advising people that, look, this is your strength. You work on this. This is your strength. You work on this. There's Everybody knows that in India today, handling the outside environment is also very important in a business. You know? So, there is one family member who handles the outside environment. Now, he may not actually have much businesses which actually are under his control. But what he does is invaluable for the family itself. And that's something you have to recognize and also compensate him for. So the CIA has done a very right thing by having a family business council which from day one starts so the fact, process of this came in one of my discussions with the, the Director General of CIA, Chandrajit Banerjee, where he informed me that this council has been set up to help business navigate settlement. Because in India, that is that Correct. he said that discussion is also not happening in families. Uh, uh, and uh, I'll take this to Mr. Bahram Vakil now. That uh, Mr. Vakil, it is said that the succession discussion often doesn't happen in families because it's a very touchy subject. And letting go is part of the deal. So people don't want to let go. Third, I want to ask you is that uh, many times which child in the family or, you know, which son has given more of his time and effort in a business also becomes an indicator of who will inherit it because somebody who's grown the business sort of has the rights to inherit it. But could you share with us that when families are large with five and six children, when they are three and four brothers, how complicated does it become? And is letting go a part of the whole deal that people should be having the ability to let go of assets? No, so absolutely. There's no question what you just said and Ryan also alluded to with ego. I mentioned that this is a very emotional subject. So uh, it's not an easy subject at all. And therefore I feel that a truly enlightened uh, uh, founder, if you will, uh, like, uh, you, uh, you know, there are many mind-blowing things that Jamshedji Tata did more than 100 years ago. Yes. Like, uh, you know, uh, structuring philanthropy in the constitution of the group. I mean, today we say it, but really 
it was already put there. It's like, you know, AI within. So there's nothing that you can do for the next hundred years. So in some ways, I was thinking if a really enlightened leader could put that succession structure, because prevention is, you know, the best cure. And the longer you leave it to your point, let me take the example of, you said five children. And no, no five uh, human beings are the same. Each comes with their strength. Someone may work harder. Someone may be more focused. And then they will have children. So with each generation, it becomes very, very complicated. Uh, so that is why I say that the earlier you create this structure, whatever works for you, because this is so personal. And, uh, you know, let me say, uh, which again you alluded to, that uh, lawyers are also, you know, not without their egos. So how good are... Uh, I'm a very proud Indian, but I just think because we are so emotional, I don't think we are great at succession or letting go. And that's good for law firms. I mean, Ryan is a very dear friend. I can ask him uh, upfront whether he thinks that any of us are good at succession planning. So we really need to structure this better. And the question I would put out to all three of you, because you are the real experts, is that we all know that India has more promoter-driven companies than probably any large economy in the world. So is it time, have we matured enough that we separate management and ownership like they do in the rest of the world uh, so that you have less of this friction and then you set it up, you know, through CII, other bodies, experts, you set up smooth succession planning. There are many models that have worked very well in India as well. Uh, do you do it that way? Having said that, let me tell you whether it's the US, uh, again, one of Ryan's good friends, look at the Murdoch mess. Uh, so it again shows you the later you leave it, people get more rigid with age. Uh, and lots of examples, the only one I can give you is myself. But uh, so, th th you know, I leave that thought that should be moved to that. Keeping in mind that unless you have the planning, even there, when the shit hits the fan, the promoters come in and it gets messy. Point, point well taken. I take this to senior advocate Percival Billimoria. On the specific question, Mr. Billimoria, uh, how is a family settlement agreement structured? What is the law? And uh, what any exemptions people get when they go through this? Any tax exemptions that are applicable? Yeah, so, I mean, this... Uh particular transaction is another example of the exemptions. Uh, but uh, to answer your first question, you know, before we go there, uh, one aspect that I think we have all noted is that the family has to be willing to A, not, you know, wash dirty linen in the public and, and to graduate to a situation where everyone accepts that, look, at the end of the day, even if today we don't have a dispute, it is likely that future generations will have a dispute. And as I said earlier, the courts have recognized the fact that even if today you don't have a dispute, I mean, there may be an anticipated dispute and you are uh, simply trying to avoid any further dispute by arriving at the settlement. And that is a very valuable exercise and it should not go to waste. Uh, okay. as far, and also, you know, in terms of the arrangements, I mean, the very fact that some of these agreements have landed up in court means that it's not always that the agreement is respected to the letter and the spirit. And to that extent, it is also a tribute to the, to the law firms who get involved in these uh, aspects and craft uh, these kind of agreements. And I... My observation is that when you try to split too many hairs, you know, so you would try to carve up businesses. It has to be a very neat carve up. You can't say that I will retain this particular business in another market and you take this business in, in the other market because that's a recipe for disaster. And I think it's really the wisdom of the lawyers and if there's any investment banker perhaps who... Uh, it's their responsibility to guide the families uh, to this. Uh, there, as far as exemptions are concerned, there is a tax exemption uh, for uh, 
family arrangements, as they call it. Uh, then, uh, you know, inevitably, if you have listed companies, the takeover code kicks in. Now, I uh, what I little I read about this transaction is that the takeover code did not kick in uh, in this situation, but there was probably one uh, company where uh, where it did. And then the other issue is, of course, competition law, because uh, there is a realignment of shares and, uh, you know, the entire business is carved up into two or more uh, baskets and the baskets have to be equal, of course. So when that when that realignment happens, there may be certain common businesses. So there may be a company which has a particular business which goes into basket A and then Basket B and C also have that, so there are horizontal overlaps. And then the Competition Commission of India has to be notified if the thresholds specified in the law are exceeded. And then in this case, I, uh, what I read in the news media is that the Competition Commission of India said that, well, there will not be any appreciable adverse effect on competition, which is known as AAC. So I think these are the two, three very common aspects uh, about family settlements. Point very well taken. I'll give you an anecdote uh, before I go to Mr. Kran Karanjawala. I interviewed uh, Mr. Adi Godrej many times. This was between uh, uh, the years 2008 and 2014-15. Always accessible on phone, soft spoken. The demeanor was of an approachable person. Generally, when you are at such heights of corporate India, picking up the phone on the first, second ring, answering questions to young reporters, Many promoters don't do it. Uh, they're not even required to do it. There are teams that would handle that for them. But here is a human element that come in. As I saw when I was reading what went to whom, I saw Adi and Nadir got the listed entities and the other family, which is Jamshed and others, they got the unlisted entities and the 3,000 acre land parcel. 3,000 acres in Bombay, it's worth in thousands and thousands of crores. A lot was also given away. Uh, Mr. Karan Javala, is it... Uh, the attitude of a person of how he is structured as a human being decides people are meant to fight or people are meant to settle. Do you think this is in the DNA of a person or this can be coached by a lawyer? See, it's often in the DNA of a company as Behram rightly pointed out. India has a lot of owner-driven companies and owner-driven growth because in a developing economy as the businesses start growing, initially the phase is that the owner runs the business. It's only when it reaches a very, very big height and people feel that other members of the family are not up to it, that they become sort of, uh, they, they sort of let a professional run it and they sit on the board and just oversee things. So when you have an over owner-driven company, by and large, it's either one person or one person with his one subordinate member of his family which runs these businesses. Well, I'm told you about the Murdoch family. So I'll give you an anecdote. I was once traveling with him from my friend Nasi Wadia's house to the Oberoi. We, were, we had come with Murdoch on a particular trip and we were all staying at the Oberoi and I was traveling with him in the car. And I asked him, and this was now in the year 1994, so that, that many years ago. So I asked him, I said, sir, what are your views on families and business? So he straight away said one thing. He said, Everybody can get work, no problem. But the ship has to have only one captain. What he's seeing today, what you're seeing today, is an exact replication of that. Who will be the person? Because he handed over everything to Lockton and the other family members revolted. So that's why you're seeing the litigation. He was always a proponent of the belief, because he was himself like that, always a proponent of the belief that one person must guide. You have to choose who you think is the best person. But once you give it, then that is the person who calls the shots. That is the person who takes the direction of the company in the direction in which he wants it to go. So in India, you're going to have, as long as you have owner-driven companies, you're going to have a lot of this, you know, falling out, feeling bad, somebody gets left out, somebody gets left in. These things will happen. But if can, you, you used to know Parmeshwar and Adi Godrej. And, uh, if you Very slightly. But tell me... How is it in their nature that led to the settlement in the family nature? Or are you saying it's the company itself, the structure of the company? Was like? The Godrejans by nature are a very settled family. 
and none of them is overly greedy. Each is respectful of the other. And they were able to somehow evolve a system by which one everything small, worked one, out one, well. One 30 second question before I go to Mr. Behram Vakil. Uh, the six companies have a market capitalization over 2.5 lakh crores. I'll give you an example. Modric consumers, total income is 13,000 crores. But the market cap is 1,24,000 crores. Godrej Industries income is 18,000 crores. Agrovet is 10,000 crores. Godrej Properties is 4,000 crores. Aspex Life Sciences is 700 crores. It's all yearly incomes. It's enormous amounts of money and market cap. Of course, there are unlisted entities. That is also running into tens of thousands of crores. Do you think it's very difficult when lakhs of crores are at stake? What what human qualities one needs when you go through because it's just too much of money. It's not, I mean, even for law firms, this is not what they do day to day. This would, maybe this would be one odd or two odd transactions in the entire career of the law firm that is held by a particular person. Uh, you have dealt with many such disputes at the So my court. answer straight away is no, it's easier. If you have a lot of money which you have to distribute, then it's much easier because everybody knows that even if he gets say 5% less than what was his due, it's still enough to more than satisfy his needs. It's when the pie is very small that the real problem begins. Because then the guy who gets less will find that he just doesn't have enough for his stomach to fill his stomach. Point, so point. if there's a lot of money to be distributed, by and large, people accept it. Take what you're getting. It's still somebody in the family will take it. Doesn't matter, yeah. How does it matter? We still own. Come on. I think Tarun, to answer your question very black and white. Definitely, the DNA of the Godrej family helped enormously. There is no question. He, okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, I had the privilege of working with uh, ABG quite a lot, and he's a thorough gentleman, and so are they all. So definitely, the uh, family DNA helped enormously. And one more example is, I, someone mentioned, I think, Ryan, I had the great privilege of meeting senior Mr. Munjal, and that was in regard to the uh, amicable. The key word he kept telling me was amicable, amicable. Uh, bet between the Japanese and him. So he said to me, the joint venture is truly like a marriage. So even if I have to leave something on the table, Mr. Vakil, I want to be sure my main attempt is not the commercial maximization, but it being amicable. The Japanese and me have been friends all along and it must remain that way. So there is no doubt that uh, the leadership and the family's DNA matter a lot. Second thing I want to reiterate is what Percy said very rightly, simple is best. You know, if you overstructure, overcomplicate, however much, however big these may be, and they are huge, uh, keep it as simple as possible. That's the genius. Not complicating it like crazy. And again, to come back to my point that we've been talking about and something which I would really uh, ask you to consider for the future as well, is I think we have reached a stage. I mean, I'm not sure whether we are third or fourth. We have definitely, uh, you know, crossed, uh, sorry, fourth or fifth, because I think we have pretty much crossed Germany or we will cross very soon because Germany, we all know, is growing at virtually 0%. So at that size of the economy, uh, though we have a lot to do, I see and AZB sees a big change. You know, buyouts used to be very rare, again, because we're emotional and the promoters don't want to sell out majority. Very rare. Today, not so rare. Because as the generations come, there are, whether it's, again, succession planning, whether... It's each generation wanting different things for themselves, different ambitions. You do see more and more buyouts. So I think we are definitely evolving and we are at the stage where we can create good systems to avoid such conflicts. Point well taken. I'll go to uh, Advocate Percival, uh, Senior Advocate Percival Billy Moria. Mr. Billy Moria, we could see companies whose market cap is 2 lakh crores, but the sales will be less than 10, 15,000 crores. Money these days has a lot of, uh, in a sense, varied variables for, in a sense, measure. How do you measure money? Do you think it is very complicated when you're drawing up, say, an asset base of 6-7 lakh crores? 
between land assets because land in India is highly valued. I mean, in Godrej's case, of course, the land holdings they have are, in a sense, uh, could be much more worth than the listed companies also given what land rates are in Bombay. I want to ask you how difficult or easy it is to go through this process. Yeah, some of these uh, negotiations can be very hard, <clears throat> not just because of the ego, but because of the nature of the asset. So, first of all, you know, as regards uh, promoter-driven companies, uh, I have an interesting anecdote here. There was once a litigation which involved a Canadian company. And I had a great deal of difficulty explaining to the court that there was no promoter because it was a widely held company. I mean, you had, there was no, there's no concept of a promoter sometimes, you know, and in our country, you have uh, even the smaller companies, not just the large groups, but even the smaller companies in our corporate law is also oriented. Uh, likewise, uh, SEBI talks about promoter, company law talks about promoters. So uh, that's a uh, great distinguishing factor. And, uh, you know, like, as Behram said earlier, perhaps one of the ways to now mature into transition is to say that, okay, I am the owner, I'm going to take a back seat and uh, perhaps bring in professional management. Uh, it hasn't always worked. Uh, there have been even situations where a particular uh, lawyer was accused of, uh, you know, getting his hands uh, in the till in, in such a situation. But it, it's a very complex negotiation. And one of the main complexities is the valuation of assets. So especially when you have brands. Now, how do you value brand? Because that's an intangible. Land valuation probably is far easier than valuing brands. Uh, it, it, it's a very uh, difficult subject. I agree with you. We've seen after even separation, companies get into arbitrations over who can use which brand. We yeah. happened in a corporate group in Delhi recently. Uh, yeah. I, so I'll go to Mr. Uh, so point well taken. I'll go to Mr. Karanjabala. So if you could, in a sense, give me three final points uh, as part of your closing comments, the three lessons that corporate India could learn from the Godrej family settlements. So is there is the voice audible? Yes. So the first thing you have to realize is what is when you look at the balance sheet of going to court, what is the negative? The negative is, according to me, it's a seven to ten year rule. For seven to ten years, your business will stop growing. You will be stuck in court yeah. litigating. There'll be uncertainty in your mind as to what is going to come as your piece, piece of the pie or what is going to go to the other side. So generally, there will be a slowing down in growth over the years. So the first thing you have to ask yourself is, is it worth it? Isn't it better that I take a little less and then carry on with my business? Take whatever opportunity comes my way and go on with life. So that's the first learning that you have to do. Second learning, of course, is the fact that an acrimony in acrimony among families tends to become intergenerational, which is also something that you have to remember. Because at the end of the day, the the truth will not, when the truth happens, the acrimony will still remain. You will still find yourself competing with your brethren because usually you're in similar businesses. You'll still find yourself competing with your brethren in a, in a not very nice way, even after you have come to a family settlement. So these are the things that you have to see. And these are the things you have to realize. And this is the negative of going to court. Point well taken. Uh, uh, Mr. Bhairam, three takeaways and learnings from the Godrej family settlement. Yeah, I think uh, the first one, as we said, is, you know, uh, the dignity and graciousness. So I think in a situation, a difficult situation like this, always uh, be open-minded, think long-term, uh, be big-hearted. So definitely to re-emphasize, all three of us are saying, uh, litigation is a lose-lose strategy. Uh, there will always be solutions and find them. Two, I want to re-emphasize, earlier the better. So do this earlier. Prevention is the best cure. And the last one is uh, play to your strengths. 
So each human being has different strengths and weaknesses. And uh, sorry, I have to say this, but I think high time that uh, the gender divide is put to a rest and we treat men and women exactly the same. Point, point, point very well taken. Uh, the gender divide should be put to rest and men and women should be treated equal. Uh, I'll go to senior advocate Percival Billimoria for three takeaways that we can learn from the Godrej or the corporate India can learn from the Godrej family settlement. Look, uh, in my experience, I think family settlements are best done uh, when the patriarch is still around because the patriarch has the you know, the respect of the family and he can drive home a settlement uh, which may even be difficult. That's one. Second is, of course, uh, never litigate. Litigation in any situation uh, is always the last option. And, you know, that's why we have our courts who are now talking about uh, mediation as a very good, uh, uh, you know, and I do believe that it's a emerging area of practice. Litigation is never something that you should opt for, uh, especially in a family scenario. And the third is, you know, people have to resist the urge to wash their dirty linen in public because that complicates matters. And uh, I think here, uh, this is one of the situations I do remember reading something about, uh, uh, you know, environment issues in uh, some of the uh, the land that they had. And there was some disagreement on that, but we did not hear anything more about it. It's not something that people got up on a podium or a soapbox and spoke about it openly. And I think I think that's a great learning because that spoils the relations in the family. And Point. once the relations are spoiled, people get bloody-minded and say, okay, well, I will not give you this, just to spite you. Point very well taken. Uh, today, indeed, was a very interesting show. The Godrej family settlement inspiration for corporate India. There is a lot to learn. In fact, there was a lot to learn of what Parsi businessmen have done for this country. Uh, Tata is a case in point on which Mr. Ryan Karanjala has spoken often. Of course, there is a tradition of philanthropy in corporate India in the Parsi community. Will other communities do it? Uh, of course, shouldn't uh, be trusted on them. But obviously, uh, we had Mr. Behram Vakil speaking about uh, the Tata Trusts uh, and Mr. Karanjala have spoken about it enough in the past few years. Uh, but there was a lot to learn from this community that got on early into structured businesses and we have seen amicable settlements in Parsi businesses. I don't remember reading a big fight in a Parsi business house in the past 20-25 years. If there is one, of course, I would like to know, but I have not heard. So uh, I think Indeed, something to take away from for corporate India. I would like to thank uh, Mr. Behram Vakil, founding partner of AZB, Mr. Ryan Karanjawala, managing partner of Karanjawala and Company, senior advocate Percival Billimoria. You found time, came on such an important issue for corporate India, given how many successions we're going to have every year from now on. I uh, appreciate your joining us. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. For more such videos, subscribe to the NewsX YouTube channel, hit the bell icon.